Good morning, all. Can you all hear me? Yes, I'm seeing nods. And can you see the slides? Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone to today's presentation, um, which is brought to you by SAA's description section and the technical subcommittee on encoded archival standards. My name is Ashley Goslar. I am chair of SAA's description section, and I work as a processing archivist at the University of Chicago Library. I will be moderating today's webinar. And my co-hosts are Corey Neimer, who represents TSEAS, and Kate Morris, who is a member of the description section steering committee. Um, Kate will be monitor monitoring the chat um, throughout the webinar. Um, thank you, Corey and Kate. Um, let me advance my slide. Whoop. I am speaking to you today from Chicago, which is the headquarters of the Society of American Archivists and the traditional homelands of many indigenous nations, including the uh, Peoria, Miami, Potawatomi, and Sioux people. Today, the Chicago area is home to one of the largest Native American urban communities in the United States. They are a vital part of our city and a vibrant part of our professional community in the Society of American Archivists. Um, if you would like to move beyond this simple land acknowledgement and take concrete action to support our Native American colleagues, I encourage you to support and uplift the activities of SAA's Native American Archives section. This includes an upcoming um, indigenous archival training pilot program that NAS will be coordinating this fall. Um, please subscribe to their listserv and follow them on social media for announcements about the program. Today's webinar is about controlled vocabularies in practice. It is the third webinar in a three-part series. In our first webinar, attendees were given an overview of commonly used controlled vocabularies for archival description. The second webinar reviewed how to encode controlled vocabulary terms in EAD and in the new version of encoded archival uh, context for corporate bodies, persons, and families. Today, we are applying critical thinking skills to our use of controlled vocabularies. How can we use vocabularies with an inclusive or reparative description lens? So let's return to a guiding question that Michelle Combs offered us in the first webinar. When using access terms to locate or select an archival resource, will a researcher thank you, curse you, or just be confused? Um, this is also a useful framework for applying controlled vocabulary terms to archival description in an ethical way. Are the controlled vocabulary terms we have selected for a resource accurate, up to date, and respectful of the people or communities they describe? Are we using preferred terms to describe a person's identity? Um, are we using clear or euphemistic language to describe relationships of power or violence? Um, and then what do we do when a controlled vocabulary falls short? Our three speakers will address these challenges today. Michelle Cron Cronquist is a special collections cataloger at Wilson Special Collections Library at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Michelle serves as co-chair of the African American Subject Funnel Project through the Library of Congress Program for Cooperative Cataloging. And Michelle will be speaking about the Funnel Project today. Rachel Searcy is the accessioning archivist and an archive space administrator at New York University Libraries. Rachel will be speaking about her experience working with a donor to apply terms from Homosaurus, which is an international LGBTQ plus linked data vocabulary, uh, to a collection. And John DeSantis has worked as a catalog librarian at Dartmouth College for over 25 years. He is currently the interim head of cataloging and metadata services at Dartmouth. John will speak about his involvement in a student-led movement at Dartmouth in 2014 to change the illegal alien subject heading. This was an effort that was subsequently featured in the documentary film Change the Subject. I welcome our three speakers and I welcome all of you and let's get started. Uh, Michelle, the floor is yours and Corey, do I need to be the one to transfer the 
screen sharing capabilities to Michelle. You should just be able to stop your share and let her start. Okay. Did it work? Oh, hang on. I'm, it's, I think I'm still sharing. Looks good. You can see it now. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, reparative description in the context of trying to um, improve the Library of Congress subject headings. Um, so I'm a bibliographic cataloger, not an archivist, but my origin story for how I got started in doing this work actually starts with an archival example. Um, I am a, a cataloger in a special collections library, and I also work in a department with archivists. Um, and we um, we apply subject headings to our archival collections. We put them in the finding aid as well as in mark records that we create for each um, archival collection. Um, and so sometimes um, I'm consulted with questions about how to best apply Library of Congress subject headings to our archival collections. Um, so you all probably recall back in 2019 when um, the governor of Virginia was found to have been photographed in blackface in his college yearbook. And then people started finding images of blackface um, everywhere um, in old yearbooks and other in other places. Um, and that included in our collections at Wilson Library. Um, we discovered that we had collections that included images of blackface. So we started, um, the, this is just one example, these fraternity fraternity records. So we started bringing out that content. And um, so we, you know, in the free te text abstract, we could say there's images of white students wearing blackface. Um, but then the question came up, how do we bring this out using subject headings? Um, and at that point, if you searched the Library of Congress subject headings for blackface, this is what you would find. Um, you would just find subject headings for blackface entertainers and other subject headings having to do with minstrelsy. Um, so there was not a subject heading for the concept of blackface out of outside the context of entertainment. Um, so um, if you aren't familiar with how LCSH works, it's based on the idea of literary warrant, which means um, in order to have a new subject heading for something, you need to have something that's being described that um, requires that subject heading in order to describe it. Um, and at this point, I, I was a moderately experienced um, submitter of proposals to, uh, to LCSH, but I just didn't really know, like, can I cite an archival collection in order to justify a subject heading for blackface? Um, I felt very un unsure about that. It was just really outside my comfort zone. Um, so I wasn't really sure what to do and how we could bring out this aspect of these collections. Um, and then uh, fortuitously, I got this email right around that time through one of my cataloging listservs. And um, there's this group called the African American Subject Funnel Project, which at that point was looking for new members. Um, so they said at that time they had, they were pre predominantly, predominantly a group of subject experts and they were hoping to find people with cataloging expertise who could work as part of this group. Um, so I reached out to them and joined the group. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, what that group is. So the African-American Subject Funnel Project um, was formed over 20 years ago. It has not been continuously active that whole time, but it was reorganized in 2017. And our focus is on improving Library of Congress subject headings and also other Library of Congress vocabularies reflecting the African-American experience. Um, we have members with varied experience, including catalogers, subject specialists, and just anyone else who has an interest in doing this work, regardless of their area of expertise. And we have members from academic, public, and special libraries. We do our work through something called the SACO program or Subject Authority Cooperative Program. Um, that's the program that allows libraries to submit proposals for new subject headings um, to add to LCSH or changes to existing subject headings. 
um, libraries can be institutional members of SACO. Um, a lot of the members, of predominantly, predominantly the members of SACO are large academic libraries like mine, um, but there are also groups called funnels, which allow um, librarians to participate in SACO um, without, if they're not at a, an institutional member library. And there are many funnels. Um, some of them are organized geographically. Many of them are organized around different subject areas. Um, and increasingly, funnels have become a, a way that people who have a common goal around, you know, have an interest in a common subject area um, come together to try to make change in LCSH. And the thing about LCS or about SACO work is it's really very intimidating. Um, there's very little training available. There's not a lot of people who are involved um, and trained in how to do it. Um, and so forming a group like a funnel can be a really great way for people to get into the work um, by learning from other people who already know how to do it. So, um, so yeah, so I joined the group in 2019. I ended up becoming the co-chair in 2021. Um, but during back during my first year in the group, we did propose a subject heading for blackface. And um, this is how it now appears in the Library of Congress subject headings. Um, so now there is a, a, a heading that is appropriate for the, the collections that I described earlier so that we can more fully describe those materials. So speaking generally about LCSH, there are a number of problems with it. Um, it often is missing concepts, um, including ones that you really think would be in there. And I'll give some examples on the upcoming slides. Um, it also includes um, out of date and harmful terminology. Um, and, and anyone who's heard about the illegal aliens um, situation knows about that. Um, and just generally speaking, it is built from a white centric and Western centric point of view. So those are the, the problems that we try to address in the funnel um, in, in doing our work. So, so these are some of the successes that we've had in adding new subject headings to LCSH. Um, so the Great Migration is a really good example of something that was a gap in LCSH. Um, the Great Migration is a well-known concept. It's been called that for a long time. There's There are books written about it, like The Warmth of Other Suns, and yet some would, somehow nobody had ever actually proposed a subject heading for the Great Migration. Um, so that was something that we proposed um, in the funnel and got added to LCSH. Um, the Middle Passage is another example of a really well-known concept um, that we have gotten added to LCSH. Um, we've also worked on some more specific concepts like Black Wall Streets and African-American barbershops that um, allow people to more fully um, describe their collections and bring out concepts that are important in the African-American community. But besides that, we've also worked on um, improving the language in existing LCSH headings. Um, so the first big project we did was to change Blacks to Black people and Whites to White people. Um, and we were able to um, cite dictionaries and style guides that showed that using Blacks as a noun is increasingly offensive. Um, so we were able to make that case to the Library of Congress, and they agreed that it should be changed. Um, and so it was changed a couple of years ago. Um, more recently, we worked on a big project to change the subject heading slaves to enslaved persons. Um, again, uh, showing that that is the direction that our language is going, that people are using the term enslaved persons instead of slaves. Um, and um, so that was uh, that was a, um, a change that just went live last month. And then finally, um, just to give you an idea of what we're working on now, um, we are we do have some new subject headings that we are working on um, so that we have the concept of black towns or historically black towns that we're working on. Um, and um, we're also working on sort of um, umbrella terms for racial violence and race massacres. 
Um, and I don't I don't promise that any of these will go will be submitted in the form that they appear on this slide. But these are just some concepts that we are working on um, preparing proposals for. Um, and then we also have some change proposals um, that we're working on. We just submitted uh, in recent weeks a change proposal from racially mixed people to multiracial people. Again, trying to update the language to um, language that is more uh, inclusive and up to date um, so that we can be using the kind of language that we would, um, that our patrons would be more likely to search on. and um that it will um be less offensive as they, when they appear in records um and something that it was interesting that came out of that project was that the the term racially mixed or yeah racially mixed people is a related term for miscegenation um and so that led us to looking at that subject heading and um one thing we discovered is that uh, well, miscegenation is really a historical concept that's rooted in racism. Because it is a, a related term to racially mixed people, we found that people were, um, catalogers were applying the subject heading miscegenation to refer in general to um, interracial relationships, which we found very problematic. Um, so we, um, we had a meeting with the Library of Congress and discussed this extensively. We decided we didn't want to cancel the subject heading miscegenation because it is a meaningful concept um, and one that is needed in order to fully describe a lot of resources. Um, but we want to make it clear that um, this has a, a very specific meaning. And so what we landed on was adding the qualifier racism to the term. Um, so those like I said, those changes have just been proposed. It'll take several months for them to make their way through the system, um, but that is in progress. Um, and that's all I have for now. Um, and uh, I included the URL for our LibGuide, but it's probably easier just to Google it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Sorry for the pencil sharpener in my background here. Um, Rachel, you're next. All right. Okay. All right. You see my screen? Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about some of the work that we're undertaking at NYU to employ controlled vocabularies to archival collections um, in ways that aim to be equitable and anti oppressive. But um, I think, above all, what I'd like to convey this afternoon is that um, while we may not have the same control over these vocabularies as we do for our narrative archival description, we do always have options. Um, we are responsible for the metadata about our collections, and it is incumbent upon us to ensure that our collections dis collection descriptions are not only accurate, but that they represent people with care. So, um, at NYU, we employ Library of Congress subject headings as our go-to for access points to collections. But um, as Michelle said, we also recognize the Library of Congress's inherent biases, um, the slow and in many cases reluctant nature to revise the vocabulary, um, and the conceptual gaps that exist for some areas. Um, its adherence to literary warrant and privileging the experience of dominant um, identities also complicate our usage. So at NYU, we're looking for an approach that leverages the benefits of controlled vocabularies while also empowering us to more fully exercise our professional judgment and centering equity in our descriptive decision making. In recent years, we've made concerted efforts to re-examine our archival practices through the lens of anti-racism. We've done discrete reparative description projects, revised our manuals in an effort to decenter whiteness and address silences, and instituted policy changes to improve transparency about the interventions we take in our collections. Authority work is yet another part of this effort as we re-examine how we assign controlled access points, which vocabularies we use, and our role in creating name records in the name authority file. Um, just checking. 
Um, so, sorry, someone asked what LCSH means, um, the Library of Congress subject headings. Sorry about that. Um, we had a handful of known issues already in mind, um, but we also figured that because of those systemic problems uh, um, addressed earlier, we probably had more problematic headings um, than just those few. So we created an Airtable base with our archive space databases subject headings, and we identified those that we considered to be problematic. These are the terms that our colleagues and users are encountering and are potentially causing painful or uncomfortable experiences for them. So we identified three sort of tracks um, to address these issues um, because there isn't going to be a one size fits all approach. Some terms have clear and obvious replacements in a vocabulary other than the Library of Congress. Others will require additional research and or a collaboration with our colleagues. Um, and we also have some terms that are going to be best addressed through local practice than um, by using a different vocabulary. So um, enter alternate vocabularies. Um, I'm going to talk about our usage of MeSH and Homosaurus. We chose them because we felt like they could help us with some of our known issues. Um, MeSH or medical subject headings is maintained by the National Library of Medicine and is used for biomedical and health related resources. Um, it's well established in high use, albeit for specialized resources and it's regularly maintained. Um, while we don't use most of the terms in this vocabulary, we don't have a need for terms about diseases, medications or medical procedures. Um, we have found that their um, way of naming groups of people is not perfect, but reliably a bit more progressive than the Library of Congress. Homosaurus is a linked data vocabulary of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer terms that supports, supports improved access to LGBTQ plus resources, provides alternatives to harmful subject headings in other vocabularies, and addresses conceptual gaps in broader vocabularies. Um, it's overseen by an editorial board. Um, we have a number of collections documenting LGBTQ um, art and activism, and we had long been dissatisfied with many of the terms applied to these collections. Um, I'd like to just talk briefly about some of the implementation decisions that we made at the local level to determine what made the most sense to us. Um, so this is really where system functionality, each vocabulary's unique nature, and your own local context intersect. So to do that, I will use the example of how we addressed the Library of Congress subject heading for illegal aliens, um, which I believe John will be talking about in more depth. Um, this heading was um, applied to a handful of our collections. Um, and just as a little bit of grounding, um, we work with archival collections. We create the description for those collections based on our understanding of them. We select the controlled vocabulary controlled access points to apply to individual collections. And I say all of these obvious statements um, in the service of empowering us to make decisions based not only on our professional judgment, but also on our values and our ethics. So with that in mind, we decided that instead of using a term like illegal aliens or illegal immigration, which has superseded it, but in a way that we still find problematic, we chose to use a term from a different vocabulary. So we are using the um, undocumented immigrants heading from medical subject headings. Um, I don't wanna get too into the weeds of archive space specific um, terminology, but I do think it's instructive um, in terms of the sort of local policy decisions that inevitably occur. So the fields with red stars are required by archive space, um, but you can also see that there are other options available, including the authority ID and scope note field. It's worth thinking about if and how you want to use these fields um, and if you're going to use them differently for different vocabularies. The scope note field is not something we typically use um, when working with subject records at NYU, but we did decide to use it when we're intentionally using a heading from an alternate vocabulary instead of one from the Library of Congress. So in these situations, we write something to the effect of this term is intentionally used as an alternative to the LCSH X. And we do that for a few reasons. One is that if an archive space user on the staff side is searching for that harmful string, this alternative will show up for them. 
Another reason is for that of transparency in our decision making. We have a lot of legacy data in our database, including subject records that might be incorrect, obsolete, um, or our references instead of authorized headings. And so we want to leave enough of a trail of decision making um, so that if someone comes across this heading, they understand that it was applied with intention. So with all that in mind, I'd like to talk about one collection to show these ideas in practice. We have the records of Gapimni, um, a volunteer-led community organization for queer and trans people who are Asian Pacific Islander in the New York area. We first received their records in 2015. And at that point, the group's name was an acronym that stood for Gay Asian Pacific Islander Men of New York. Over time, the organization has changed both in name, Gapimni is no longer an acronym, and now works to center queer and trans people. So when we received an accretion in 2021, we needed to make some changes to the descriptive front matter to reflect that shift. But it also gave us an opportunity to revisit the subject terms applied to the collection. The organization changed its name for a reason and we wanted to represent their work um, through our descriptive record as faithfully and respectfully as possible. So um, my colleague, Shannon O'Neill, who's um, excuse me, <laughs> um, Shannon, who is the curator for this collection, she and I, I asked uh, the donors if they were interested in talking with us about this, and they said yes, um, but they also said that they uh, were busy. So sometimes, often in fact, um, this kind of collaboration can take time. So we had two main questions um, for our donor. Of the subject headings that were previously applied to the collection, which ones, if any, did they want to keep? We also said that we would like to add um, new additional terms from Homosaurus related to activism, community, and discrimination, but that for each of these terms, we had a choice to make. We could use um, a more narrow term like queer activism, for example, um, or we could use a broader term like LGBTQ plus activism. We made it clear to them that we were happy to do either. Um, but that to the greatest extent possible, we'd like to be consistent. And so they said that um, the broader umbrella terms made more sense to them. We also had an additional wrinkle. Uh, a few of the original Library of Congress terms applied to the collection described groups of people in pejorative ways. Why describe people by what they are not rather than who they are? At that point in time, Homosaurus had a term for Asian American LGBTQ plus people, but not uh, Pacific Islander American LGBTQ plus people. Um, I sent an email to the Homosaurus uh, contact email, um, basically with the information I've just gone over. And I got an email back very quickly, um, very welcoming that said, that sounds great. Um, are there any other terms you'd like to suggest? So um, it was just such a positive experience that Quite quickly, um, this new term was added and available in the vocabulary. Um, it was great to come back to the donor to show them the record and say, you know, we've made changes based on your input um, and also tell them that this new term was created that other libraries could use. So this collection, I think, is an encapsulation of a lot of things, of an application of different vocabularies, of iterative description, how accessioning affords opportunities to return to collections and revisit our description of them, as well as collaboration between archivists and donors. It's also a great example of the complementary um, nature of narrative archival description and controlled vocabularies. So if you remember, this organization changed its name and focus to center queer and trans people, but the donor recommended using the broad term um, for the controlled access points. Um, but it also, so while those controlled um, terms are uh, more broad in the scope note and in the historical note, we were able to be more specific and add nuance to really highlight that focus. I think it's also a great example of how much power and choice we actually have. Um, if we don't like the options in one vocabulary, we can choose another. We can do something different with subject terms than we do with free text description. We make these decisions um, based on what we know about the collection, the creators, the record subjects, and our users. Um, and while I don't expect to be successful every time I ask for a new term, 
Um, it's also worth remembering that sometimes I will be. So um, just to wrap up with a few um, parting observations, I would say if you're wondering where to start, start with your collections and the issues that you already have on your mind. I'd also recommend limiting yourself to a small number of vocabularies, at least at first. Take the time to get to know them, how they operate, and how you want to use them. Um, you should consider long-term maintenance because terms can and will change. Third, there is no perfect vocabulary. Um, each, they're all created by people and we all have our biases. And lastly, um, it's good to know what the Library of Congress is up to even when you're looking elsewhere. Um, I still use the Library of Congress and I think there's value to it as a vocabulary, um, but you also don't necessarily have to plan your actions around them. So um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope this was interesting um, or helpful if you've ever wondered about alternate vocabularies and how you might use them. Um, like I said at the beginning, um, at the end of the day, we're responsible for our metadata and its impact on staff and users. And we do have the ability to mitigate some of the damage caused by harmful or inaccurate headings. Um, I've put my email here as well as the link to um, the LibGuide where we have all of our documentation. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Okay, and last but not least, John, it's your turn. My apologies. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so for a, a little disclaimer, I'm, I'm not an archivist and not part of the archival community. Um, I'm, I'm a catalog librarian and I was invited to this program on reparative description in order to share the story of the illegal alien subject heading. It's a trip down memory lane, really. Um, it's a story that has been unfolding over the past several years about how a group of undergraduate students at Dartmouth, together with librarians, um, petitioned the Library of Congress to change the subject heading illegal aliens. It's actually a remarkable story, but it's more than just a story about a subject heading change. It's about many different things. On one level, it's a story about the power of the voice against injustice and the remarkable dedication of a group of student activists in fighting for discursive change. At the same time, the story reveals some of the moral and ethical questions that we face in librarianship. And on a macro level, it illustrates some of the struggles and provocations of the wider immigration debate in the United States. So uh, let me set the stage here. The long saga of the illegal alien subject heading actually began here at Dartmouth College. So I first wanna give you some context. Uh, Dartmouth is in Hanover, New Hampshire, about halfway up the state and directly on the border with Vermont. Um, here are some quick facts about the, uh, the town of Hanover. Here are a couple of sh uh, shots of the downtown Hanover. It's a rather upscale, small college town uh, immediately adjacent to the campus. A few quick facts about the college. It's technically it's a university, even though it's called a college. A couple of images of the campus. And a few facts about the library. The main library primarily uh, for humanities and social sciences is Baker Berry, and it also houses the mathematics library. We're a research library, member of the Association of Research Libraries and the Center for Research Libraries. We have about 140 library staff. We used to be a much larger. A few shocks of inside the library and the outside. This is uh, the main library, Baker Berry, on the left. Okay, so. Um, let me give you some context. On March 22nd, 2016, the Library of Congress announced in a press release that it had, and I quote, concluded that the meaning of aliens is often misunderstood and should be revised to non-citizens, and that the phrase illegal aliens has become pejorative. The heading illegal aliens will therefore be canceled. So 
Um, I'm going to pick this up later on, but this is a uh, this is the the, the point that uh, that we're starting from. So uh, it all began with what librarians may refer to as the reference interview. My colleague Jill, who's also the director of the film, changed the subject. Who was helping a student with a research paper, and they were consulting the online catalog. In one record, the student noticed a subject heading with the words "illegal aliens." The student, Melissa, was shocked to discover that Dartmouth Library was using this term in our catalog. So about two weeks after Melissa and Jill had that initial encounter, a document named the Freedom Budget was released to the campus community. The Freedom Budget was authored by a coalition of student activists, the Action Collective, and consisted of a list of demands for a more inclusive campus environment. The uh, document was organized in eight sections, and the last section called Miscellaneous contained these two demands. Um, uh, ban the uh, use of uh, illegal aliens and immigrants and so on, and that the library's search catalog system shall use undocumented instead of the legal in reference to immigrants. Well, as soon as we saw the freedom budget, we knew right away that the item here addressing the library catalog had originated in Jill's encounter with Melissa. I felt a complex mix of things at that moment. Uh, delight at the fact that the students had taken notice of the library catalog enough to critique it, but also the sense, accurately or not, that the critique was leveled at us, as if to say the librarian shall use undocumented instead of illegal in reference to immigrants. Um, Um, so we weren't exactly uh, sure what to do about this. The students at first believed that Dartmouth alone had made the decision to use the subject heading illegal aliens in our catalog. So we held a meeting with them to explain how these headings actually get into our catalog. We suggested to the students that changes do happen over time to the subject headings, but that generally these came about as the result of the Library of Congress's internal editorial processes, and that outside users could suggest new headings but we weren't sure how successful we would be at suggesting a modification of a heading. So rather than flounder, Jill contacted me in my capacity as a catalog librarian and our NACO coordinator to see if it would be possible for us, the Dartmouth Library, to propose a change to illegal aliens. Meanwhile, Jill contacted our library administration, relaying the commitment of the co-fired students and the sense of urgency that we respond and not let this just fade away. So our um, associate university librarian at the time, Biz Kirk, was very supportive and came up with the idea that the students joined the library in developing a subject heading change proposal. So here's a uh, sample of the memo she sent out to co-fired and to the faculty advisors. So we met as a group on March 24th, 2014, the co-fired students, uh, librarians, a faculty member, and two administrators. In this meeting, I gave a presentation about the history of subject heading changes and described what making such a proposal would necessitate in terms of gathering research. So um, subject terminology used to describe group, groups of people can seem innocuous and acceptable in one era and evolve over time into terms which are viewed as offensive or outdated for various reasons. Uh, there's a long history of this in LCSH. So here you see the italics indicate a, a former heading that has been replaced with more acceptable terminology. Um, although regarding that, that last one, um, uh, I have to say, so uh, despite evidence of current usage, um, Library of Congress has announced its intention to remove the heading gays because frankly, it is not really used and, it, and it's, no one would think to, to uh, come up with that term in a catalog search. So um, it, it continues to evolve. Um, but just despite the fact that uh, Jennifer Coons chose to use it. Um, as you can tell, this slide is outdated. Here's a, a notorious example of uh, the, the heading changing over um, over a period of time. Um, I was not aware until today, thank you very much, for, Michelle, for uh, alerting me that the heading Blacks um, has been replaced by Black people as it should have been. 
so the co-fired students, along with the uh, uh, reference librarians, took on the task of researching evidence for the proposal, often referred to as, as we heard earlier, literary warrants. So here are some of the uh, sources that we consulted. This is uh, an example of some of the evidence that we collected. These citations were gathered by a faculty member working with the co-fired students. More evidence that uh, the term undocumented immigrants was used in a variety of indexes of the survey. And so we used all this evidence in, in our proposal. This is uh, the, the first part of the proposal. It's, it's, it continues on uh, off screen, but uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, Dartmouth is a member of the PCC, the Program for Popular Cataloging, uh, which allowed us to submit a subject heading change proposal through SACO. And this is what the proposal looked like when Elsie uh, uh, got a hold of it, and they were, you see they, they made their little uh, um, notes on it. It took a long time for Elsie to respond to our proposal. In the first half of 2015, we received a response. So uh, as you can see, uh, the, the bottom line is the proposals were not approved. And they cite, cited a couple of compelling reasons for not approving it. Of course, the students were very, very disappointed. But wait, <laughs> that wasn't the end of the story. Um, at ALA Midwinter 2015, the librarian Tina Gross wanted to continue to pursue the issue with the Library of Congress following their decision. So she worked with various ALA constituencies, and eventually a resolution was brought to ALA Council. This is what the resolution looked like. Um, it, it went through all of the various ALA constituencies, endorsed all, by all of them, and it, it passed um, very easily at ALA Council. Well, this takes us back to the very first slide. Then um, out of the blue, and Clearly, in response to uh, to ALA's uh, resolution, um, the Library of Congress decided that they were going to replace the heading of the aliens. Now, this is 2016. Uh, this is what they proposed, that they uh, um, were retiring of the uh, heading aliens, replacing it with non-citizens. And then they also in kind of an unprecedented move, um, sent a, put up a survey allowing people to voice their opinions on this uh, um, solution. Here's the summary of what the Library of Congress uh, proposed to delete illegal aliens, establish non-citizens, establish unauthorized immigration, and use the two of them uh, together in one record to express the concept that illegal aliens have had uh, records on those. Of course, uh, then, you know, with all the media attention uh, that resulted from this, uh, there's a significant amount of backlash, first in the media, then in the Congress. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, to that story, but the entire saga of this was documented in, in Jill's film, uh, Change the Subject, which if any of you have not yet seen, you, you really should. It's available online. Okay, so then what? In uh, June 2019, uh, representatives from ALA, um, at the time it was called uh, Alex Association for Library Collections and Technical Services, um, met with uh, representatives from LC just before the annual conference to talk about the fact that for years, you know, nothing ha has happened. They made this proposal to change the heading and then did not act on it. Um, the Library of Congress indicated that they were not in any position to do anything and basically said we, we can't really talk about it and for obvious reasons. Um, so uh, the Subject Analysis Committee formed a working group to continue to explore this issue with the subject heading of illegal aliens. In the meantime, libraries were getting tired of the Library of Congress not changing the headings, so they came up with their own solutions. Uh, several libraries in 2020, led by the pioneering work of the California State University Library System, began to modify their local catalogs to remove the illegal alien subject heading from the public catalog. Um, so above, we can see the uh, 
deprecated terminology currently that was currently in use in LC uh, at the time, and then the transformations that they uh, created uh, for the public catalog. As far as I know, this is the only time there's been such an organized widespread effort by libraries to deviate from an authorized LC heading in the catalog. Almost done here. Um, meanwhile, um, there continued to be pressure on the Library of Congress to actually make uh, the change uh, to the established legal alien subject heading. The ALA Public Policy and Advocacy Office uh, began meeting with officials at the Library of Congress to see if they could uh, come to a solution. Um, legal counsel met with them. Finally, in November 2021, the Library of Congress made an announcement that illegal aliens will finally be replaced with new terminology. Very similar to what they initially proposed, but apparently they, they had to, uh, um, because it's Congress, they, they had to keep that word illegal in there, unfortunately. So this is the solution that uh, they currently came up with, and this solution was actually implemented. What's happening next, as we've already heard from others, um, they're going to uh, turn their attention to the Native American and Indigenous community. Um, this, this heading, of course, has been problematic for a long time. Um, they did just come out maybe two weeks ago with a statement saying that uh, they are going to hire a staff person to handle these matters, form an advisory committee, and actually reach out to um, individual uh, tribal communities uh, to have their input in establishing these uh, headings for um, Native Americans. And here are some uh, resources if you want to read more about this. And then we'll, I guess we'll all take questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I have been seeing a lot of really good questions coming in through the chat. And um, Kate, you have been compiling them. Can you start us back at the beginning, please? Yes, definitely. And I've seen some great discussion in the chat as well. Um, so I'll start with the first question. Um, have you had any change proposals that were rejected? If so, can you say what they were? I think um, that question, yeah, was aimed at you, Michelle. Yeah, um, I cannot think of one. Um, the thing about these big, um, the projects that I'm talking about, um, where we're changing black, like blacks to black people that actually affected over a hundred headings because there are so many, um, different subject headings, like, um, you know, it's not just blacks to black people. Then there's like urban blacks changed just to ur urban black people and so on. And so, um, we're always in communication with the Library of Congress as we work on it. Um, we don't just like spring it on them. They, they want you to let them know that you're doing a big project. Um, so uh, so we should have a pretty good idea when we go in that that they're um, on board with it. So, um, so yeah, I don't have any examples of ones that have been rejected. And I think this next one might also uh, be for you, Michelle, um, is the term, enslaved people meant to apply only within the USA's boundaries and timeline or for all times and places, for instance, ancient Greece? Um, it should be for all um, all times and places. Um, yeah, there, there's, if you look at the record, there's nothing uh, in it about um, being restricted to a certain place or time. Okay, um, moving on to the next one. Uh, when reviewing LCSH, uh, how would you determine uh, which terms would be harmful or more appropriate? Would the community or communities have the same idea or reach an agreement? And I think this could be answered by, by any of our panelists today. So a, a big question about community input and engagement. I can maybe start us off. Um, we like to have sort of as many avenues towards, you know, redescription and reassessment as possible. So, um, you know, sometimes things like this come up in the course of accessioning or processing a collection where um, the archivist working on the collection will 
take a look at legacy metadata and um, you know have see that something's maybe not accurate or not um, not appropriate. Um, but we also receive that kind of input from our colleagues who work on the reference desk or teach classes or are working on exhibitions um, if they come across things um, as well as um, you know if they notice like a, a, so a researcher in the reading room make a comment. Um, we also have uh, a form that's uh, linked in a few different places um, on our different kind of like web presences that allow people to um, just submit um, an issue um, and they can do that anonymously if they like. So um, we like to be able to um, have it come from a lot of different places because we all have, we all have our blind spots. Well, as, I, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, it actually took a member of the community affected to bring to our attention that the library was using harmful vocabulary. We were just so accustomed to just blindly using whatever else he established without questioning it. And this made us step back and say, hey, they're right. We are using harmful uh, terminology. We should do something about it. Um, yeah, and I'll say, um, it, like in my group, we stay pretty narrowly focused on one subject area. Um, and we have a lot of people who are experts on that subject area, either through their training or their personal experience. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, when you look at LCSH holistically, there's so much that's problematic and so much that we look at and we say, oh my goodness, that's just not, that's not good. But um, uh, it, and it does become very tricky, but um, I, I think if we uh, stay uh, focus on what we know, then um, we can uh, make change in that area. And this is a related question. Um, uh, this says, uh, Rachel, I really appreciate the community centric collaboration you described. How would your approach have changed if the group was no longer active or con contactable? Yeah, that's a good question. It obviously makes it a lot more difficult. And um, yeah, may, might be the situation for like a legacy collection. Um, I think you would maybe have a few different options. Um, I think taking it upon yourself to do some research and education um, is an important first step. Um, try to find if there are resources that are relevant um, created by and for the community that's uh, relevant to the resource, although with a caveat there that no community is a monolith and um, there's there may not be a kind of unanimous consensus. Um, I would also maybe, you know, relationships I think are really important here. Um, if you have a colleague or if you have, um, you know, another relationship that you could maybe um turn to for advice although again always being mindful that to try not to make those like extractive relationships that you you give as much as you're taking um and then I guess the other kind of point I would make is just like acknowledgement that you can work to hopefully improve something um but that you may need to change it again and that like that kind of iterative work is okay um and just kind of being open to that and kind of being open to admit when you're not the kind of authority on the matter. Great. The next question is, uh, do you have any concerns about using alternative terms that may be common in the US but not often used in other countries? I work in an institution focused on non-US subject matter and we're wrestling with some issues related to an increasingly shrinking world and using terms that may not be clear on an, to an international audience. Michelle, do you wanna take a stab because you've been working on a project that is very US centric? Or... Right, oh, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it gets it gets very tricky. And I think we are, we do tend to be pretty US centric in our views. I mean, every, as, as we've worked on projects, every once in a while, someone will point out like, wait a minute, what about X other place? This has, term has a totally different meaning there. Um, I know the Library of Congress does try to keep um, international use in mind in um, establishing LCSH and, and you know, um, possibly add a qualifier to a term to make it more clear, even if it would be clear in a US context. Um, but yeah, it is, it's just very tricky. That's just the nature of controlled vocabularies um, that uh, one size doesn't fit all. And yet that's the way that controlled vocabularies work. I should also point out that there are uh, many <clears throat> um, translations of the Library of Congress. That, and I think that very often in translation, um, they can address some of those uh, concerns um, that the, the English term would not. It looks like we have one more question um, in the chat. And we have and one we... minute left. Okay. We can go over by a minute or two, but. Okay. Um, as an archivist and trained historian originally, I've always had issues with LCSH, especially with topics like military veterans, for example, injured, disabled, et cetera. But I've seen justifications for authorized terms in LCSH taken from incorrect sources or easy sources by catalogers like Wikipedia or books referencing a topic that is not the right one for the terms tied to them. Why does LSC place the barrier for proof of need slash literary justification so high when their authorized terms list demonstrates the opposite? Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, I think it's extremely important to remember with LCSH that everyone at the Library of Congress is human and we all are who participate in it are human as well. And everyone's just doing the best they can in the moment. Um, so I um, would urge people not to be afraid to try to change, make changes to LCSH. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, if, you know, if you're not a SACO participant and you see problems, you probably, um, uh, you might not know what to do. You might not know who to talk to or how to get something changed. Um, but um, I, I, if you look at the list of SACO funnels, you might find a group that would be a, a good one to get involved with. Um, you're certainly free to email me. Um, yeah, I just... Uh, I, I don't really know how to answer your question other than, than to say people are just uh, trying to do their best. I see. I mean, I find really egregious errors in LCSH sometimes, and I think, how did this get through? But it happens. Okay, I think we'll we'll pause there, and I want to thank everybody for um, uh, attending today, and thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, I think the the over you know, ar arching message here today is that um, we can collaborate to bring about change, even if it's slow. You can um, bring change through Seiko. You can work with records creators to bring about change. You can work with student groups. You can work with a professional organization like ALA to um, advocate for change. So there are many avenues. Um, to pursue uh, this iterative practice that we are all involved in. Um, I wish all of you a, a great rest of your day. Um, the recordings will be up, um, as Corey mentioned, um, on SA's YouTube channel, um, we hope by, by the end of the week. And um, please uh, stay tuned to other activities that the SA description section and TSEAS are involved in. Thank you all. Thank you.